Hello and welcome to this important but possibly disturbing conversation on the situation in Ukraine. We want to look briefly back at the last desperate 100 plus days since the invasion by Russia, the extraordinary civilian and military response to that ongoing attack and the defense of Ukraine's freedom, its freedoms. I do believe that this struggle, uh, the struggle, our struggle for existence, for freedom and against tyranny is quite comprehensible for any society in any corner of the world and in a planet, you know. We understand with more and more clarity that our way, our, our war is about security in Europe. It's not just about Ukraine. It's about defending democratic values of the whole world. And I'm really glad that our friends all over Europe, and especially in the United Kingdom, also have similar understanding of the war and provide increasing support to Ukraine and our people. These 100 days, which started on the 24th of February, uh, made me for sure, and I'm, I'm certain that many other people feel 100 years older. It's as if we have lived through generations and generations. I think we have all replaced the saying work-life balance with war-life balance. And uh, we have learned many things about ourselves. We have discovered strengths we never knew we had. Uh, we have realized that many things that we thought mattered don't matter anymore. For me, for example, um, today making a journey of um, 12 plus hours to see my children uh, twice or once a month is literally nothing. When before I used to complain about three hours on the plane. Actually, uh, it's not just Putin. It's all of Russia's uh, political establishment. It's all the strategists, all the experts. Um, Russia's policy towards Ukraine was always that Ukraine and Ukrainians have no right to exist as a nation. Uh, this is written in their national doctrine, the Ruski Mir, the Russian world doctrine, and that doctrine is espoused by any who comes to power in Russia, uh, be it Putin, be it his predecessors, be it as far back as the Tsars. Um, so we must be clear about that, that this has been something um, nourished for generations and generations of Russians. Um, the so-called opposition in Russia, and I say so-called very um, uh, aware uh, of what it means, uh, because that opposition, if you ask them, they may be in opposition to Putin, but if you ask them how do they feel about Crimea and how do they feel about other aspects of Ukrainians being Ukrainian, they will give a very Russian answer. Uh, meaning that essentially Ukrainians don't have the right to exist. And we have to face this truth, not just here in Ukraine, but also in the world beyond. Uh, we cannot, uh, the world cannot continue living with the illusion of a romanticized Russia, a very seductive image that has been portrayed in novels, a sort of kind of controlled wild, wild west, uh, where you can go and you know ha have your different kinds of experiences and still still come back and you know uh, very close to Europe and and to civilized world so to speak that that's not what Russia is about. I have different type of uh, military people who are friends of mine and who work with me currently and who I'm in touch with on a daily basis just because of the work. Uh, some people been. Um, uh, professional military and uh, in my position I had to deal with uh, those guys like pretty much most of my time so for them of course it's a moment of truth so it's a moment for which they've been building up their capabilities um, and they understand that this is it because uh, we all understand that Putin's strategic goal is to destroy Ukraine uh, completely so for them of course this is an extremely moment of extreme tense uh, and uh, understanding that uh, that's it there's no there's there's no balance of any kind of a private life and, and work anymore. This is all just uh, all just work. But again, for those professional military, this is work. And then I have lots of friends who joined the army just recently, uh, territorial defense, just regular armed forces and uh, all kinds. For them, it's the moment when uh, many of them psychologically just, uh, you know, when we're, we're not, they were not prepared for that yet because they had like civilian lives. Ukraine doesn't have plan B. 
unlike Russia. Russia switching from one plane to the other all the time. So they started to was trying to capture Kiev, then they switched to other cities, then they switched to east, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They they're trying to find a way to at least achieve something. Ukraine doesn't have any any plan. We just need to get them out of Ukraine, and that's it. And the understanding that there are homes at stake and families at stake and everything. I mean, it's uh, obviously. Uh, we, we very well know what this is all for. And for me, this war is a conflict of civilizations. I think this is the existential war. And uh, the stake in it is uh, whether Ukraine will exist or vanish. And it's not only um, existential for the state, but I think it's also existential for each of us. It's also the matter of personal existence of each of us. I think that in these 100 days, we all uh, change it a lot. And I think that um, on 24th of February, we woke up as a very brave nation. And the missiles were our alarm clock, which uh, woke up us and this uh, braveness in us. I would divide uh, Russian narr- uh, narratives um, into two categories. The ones are the permanent, the core ones, uh, and the second are more dynamic and situated. First, I will talk about the permanent ones. Uh, the permanent one is uh, to uh, um, uh, describe Ukraine as an uh, uh, to, to talk about the one nation or about uh, brotherly nations, and describe Ukraine as a younger brother who needs support and help from the older brother. It, uh, this strategy also includes taking best from Ukrainian uh, culture and brand it as a part of Russian culture. And it's also about um, uh, building and um, working on uh, the inferior uh, complex in Ukraine and uh, calling Ukraine the little Russians. Uh, this is like more and uh, the part of this narrative is, uh, of course, um, the um, uh, tethys that uh, Ukraine uh, doesn't exist as a nation, as a country, and that it was created by Lenin. That was uh, the quote of uh, Vladimir Putin, as you remember. Um, so uh, these uh, narratives they remain uh, for they remain for all the times, and they've been lasting for years. Uh, but uh, the more, more um, um, the worse uh, narratives are taking place now because shaking the Western support is now Russians' main goal. First of all, uh, the, for uh, reaching this goal, they uh, use different narratives. First of all, is that Ukraine has nothing to hope for and the West won't help and Ukraine will be left on its own. The second one is that Ukraine takes attention from really important global problems which uh, uh, the world has to solve. And uh, instead of helping Ukraine and sending Ukraine all the money, all the, um, uh, all the aid, all the weapons and all the attention, uh, instead of um, treating uh, uh, all the countries and all the nations equally. The third one is that uh, if the war is so horrible, then why does not uh, Ukrainians start negotiation with Russia. Why don't they sit at this uh, table of negotiations? This is very dangerous thesis, which I heard a lot during um, uh, watching European TV. And uh, this scared me a lot, practically speaking, because um, there is nothing to negotiate for because we were just living our normal life when Russians, Russia invaded our country and uh, started to take our lands and started killing our people. And um, so, yeah, I guess this is the main uh, situation on dynamic narratives, which Russia uses now. I'm from Kherson. This is a city at the south of Ukraine, which is now heroically holding on um, under the Russian occupation. And uh, people in uh, Kherson, they were most, mostly talking Russian. And for me, for example, I was born and uh, uh, as I was born and uh, as uh, I went to school, I've always, uh, I always was using Russian language to express my thoughts, to write my texts, everything. 
And what's happening in uh, Kherson right now? A few days ago, all the communication there, they have all completely disappeared. The invaders uh, cut off all the Ukrainian telecom operators and all the uh, internet providers. And my friend uh, has managed to, uh, to download a VPN and call, and call me. And he told me what's happening, what's going on there. Uh, so um, uh, the invaders told, uh, are telling everyone that this is the Ukrainian army who cut off all the communications because they don't care about Kherson anymore. And moreover, um, the big uh, car with a loudspeaker um, is... Uh, uh, goes on and on in the city center and keeps telling through, through this loudspeaker that Ukrainian army has left you, you are abandoned and no one cares about you. So uh, we offer uh, cooperation and Russian passports. So come to military commandant's office and for, for further cooperation. Uh, the very interesting thing is that Khersonians, they are love at this and they hate invaders, and uh, they were also laughing on uh, a Russian TV um, uh, reel, which described it, uh, which passed um, off uh, the queue for SIM cards as a queue for Russian passports. And Ukrainians, uh, uh, Khersonians, they're laughing about that because this is simply not true. They were standing for SIM cards because they cut off all the communications. But this is the funny thing, but there is also not very funny thing because FSB agents there in Kherson, they are looking for all the people with the slightest pro-Ukrainian position. And then they took them to the commandant's uh, office and these people just vanish, they just disappear. So now Khersonians have to, they, they, that's, um, um, they, they, they can't, for example, um, come to the cities of the city with a, a yellow and blue stripe because uh, they will have a very big problems with that. And it's like in Stalin's time, uh, petty wagons are taking people to the commandant's office. And it's also very, always very crowded uh, near this building because uh, the families, the women of the people that has been taken to this commandant's office, they are standing there the whole day and waiting to understand what's happening with their relatives and with their loved ones. So I just uh, wanted to, uh, you know, when you when I hear questions like this, how Ukraine can uh, live with uh, Russia, uh, I think I think stories like this uh, answer better than uh, any words. If we uh, we would talk about experience. This uh, this experience, I suppose, any film or book about the war can describe my last three months' experience. Mm, Trenches, weapons, training, hiding from Russian bombs, patrolling the streets, um, detecting uh, detecting uh, enemy saboteurs. Um, so we have a lot uh, of. Um, uh, very specific uh, work. I suppose one of the most important um, uh, moral of this situation is that if you believe in human rights and uh, democracy, you must uh, take uh, weapon and def defend this, this uh, way of thinking, way of uh, living, because Russia um, have a very concrete goal, destroy an independent Ukraine, destroy freedom in uh, uh, East Europe. So if you want to be free, you must protect this. A, a lot of uh, people in Europe uh, don't believe in, in this now, even now. They believe in uh, uh, gasoline price, yes, but not believe in um, this war. So it's one of the important uh, uh, moral of this situation about identity. Uh, I suppose history become more significant for Ukrainians uh, in this situation uh, because that millions uh, of people realize that uh, warnings from the past were not in vain. The bloody Russian Empire decided uh, to subdue us by force and we woke up with centuries of experience of resistance and struggle. But now, after three decades of experience of freedom and political independence, no one 
is surrendering without a fight in Ukraine. I believe in this, and I feel this in here in Transhi. Uh, uh, gone are the um, days when they could just deceive and assimilate us um, the way that uh, they did with Tatars, uh, Tatarstan people, Chechens, Bashkirs, Kalmyks, and others. We don't want to be slaves whose freedom, dignity, language, and culture are gradually being uh, taken away. This resistance opened uh, a new page in, uh, in the realization of our identity, I suppose. It reminds me of the st history of the Jews during World War II, uh, when millions of them felt very clearly the, their identity and its value when the Nazis started killing them just because they were themselves. Now Putin has announced uh, to the world the final solution to Ukrainian question. And Ukrainians around the world have felt that they are under threat and that there is no place for compromise, which some talk about, frankly, fools in the West and in the East about this compromise. We stand with an ultimatum. Either we stop being ourselves and live or die.